What Scripture tells us is that God is good. He is the essence of goodness. He is the universal standard, the prototype of goodness. There is none good, says Jesus, but God alone. None other is truly and holy and entirely good as God is. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, and we're continuing our series, Who is Like Our God? And uh, Jonathan, we will very often throw around the word good. You know, how you doing today? Oh, I'm good. Or how was that food? It was good. You know, but if we, if we really understand good, then ultimately it sounds like you're saying we need to take the definition of that word back to God himself. I think that's exactly right. We struggle to define good and bad in our culture these days. Those terms are taken to be entirely relative, and basically we define goodness and and badness for ourselves and by our own views and so on. There are very few objective standards that would be shared in our culture around what, what, what is defined as good and accepted as good. But for the Christian, for the one who takes the Word of God seriously, we understand that God himself is the definition and the essence of goodness. And that, that gives us a wonderful clarity when it comes to looking at the world all around us and making evaluations about what's good and bad and what's right and wrong. God himself is the standard and the bar. That's, that's wonderfully helpful, but we need to come to, to the Scriptures with a disposition of faith to be willing to accept that, of course. Well, let's go to the Scriptures today. If you can, grab a Bible and join us in Psalm 34 as we begin our message, The Good God. Here is Jonathan. It's been said before that if you can't find a fault or a failing in a person, the reason is that you haven't got to know them well enough yet. (laughs) A new friend, a, a colleague, maybe a romantic interest, whoever it is, if you see them through rose tinted spectacles, it's only because you don't really know them all that well yet. Well, that is perhaps a rather cynical outlook, but we know there's some truth to it. However much we may love or admire, look up to a person, it only takes so long before we realize that they're sinful. (laughs) Only too long before we see their weaknesses, their flaws, and their failures. And that is, of course, an inevitable thing. We're fallen creatures. We're all sinful even if we're redeemed. And we all have the capacity to disappoint those who love us and trust us and look to us. In the wider Christian world, we've seen this played out all too often. There seems to be a new scandal among Christian leaders to hit the headline every few months. It comes with a kind of depressing regularity. Within families, we know this experience too, don't we? There's so much potential for us to hurt one another, to hurt those closest to us, those dearest to us, and we do it. Among friends, within workplaces, so often trust is broken expectations are disappointed, and the person we thought we knew turns out to be a rather different person in reality. And having experienced disappointment in different measure, in different ways, at different times, we know something of the weariness that comes with this, don't we? We know the disillusionment that can set in, the reluctance to trust that can often result. We've been disappointed perhaps once too often. We've been hurt. We've been let down. And if we're honest, we've hurt and let down others more than we'd like to admit. And so we find ourselves asking, is there anyone who can be trusted? Anyone who is truly good, entirely good, good in an unmixed, pure, and uncompromising kind of a way? Does such a person actually exist? Is such a one anywhere to be found. Our theme this morning, as we've already said, is the goodness of God, the truth that our God is always good, entirely good, uncompromisingly good in every way. And for us as a people who long to find true goodness, to know reliable goodness, that simple but profound truth, it comes to us as a balm for the soul. I'd like to consider the outlines of this truth, this attribute of God, from a biblical standpoint, of course, and then I'd like to turn to consider its implications for us. I have three basic points in terms of the outline of this truth, and the first one is simply this, God is good in all that He is. God is good 
in all that He is. We delight in finding goodness wherever we can find it. It's great to read online reviews of products or restaurants or hotels or services where folk have found something to be reliable or excellent, where folk have found some kernel of goodness, and people love to share that and to delight in that and to tell other people about what they've experienced. There's a travel writer named Alistair Sorde who was popular in the UK a few years ago. Maybe he still is. I don't know. Anyway, we bought a few of his travel guides over the years, and he had this sort of knack of effusing about places in a kind of understated English way, a a way that made you just want to go and experience and see this goodness for yourself to see what he describes. I pulled out an old guide to British bed and breakfast, and here's just a random sample. This is for a place called Gold Court House in the county of Dorset. Listen to what he writes. The owners have created a mood of restrained luxury and uncluttered, often beautiful good taste in their Georgian townhouse. Bedrooms are restful in cream with mahogany furniture, sloping ceilings, beams and armchairs. There's a large drawing room and good paintings. Your hosts are delightful. They do everything to perfection, says a reader. Both house and garden are a refuge. Views are soft and lush. Well, I can give you the contact information later if you'd like. (laughs) But you see, he's found a little taste of goodness. And he wants us to discover it too, to experience it as well. The pure goodness of God is a discovery and a truth that the Bible writers delight in and rejoice over time and time again. And this is especially the case in the Psalms, of course. A number of Psalms, Psalm 106, 107, Psalm 136, they all begin with these same words, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, His love endures forever. Psalm 89 tells of the blessing of knowing this God of sheer goodness. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They exult in your righteousness, for you are their glory and their strength, and by your favor you exalt our horn. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, the Holy One of Israel. Knowing that the Lord is so good, David, like the enthusiastic reviewer who has found something truly wonderful to share, he urges others in Psalm 34, as we already heard, he urges us to discover what he has found. Taste and see, says David, that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The Lord is good. That's a basic proclamation of the Scriptures, and it's a very, very wonderful truth to know and to hold on to and to delight in. Richard Baxter writes, if there be a thought that is truly sweet to the soul, it is the thought of the infinite goodness of the Lord. And it is sweet to the soul, isn't it? It's a wonderful truth. But when we say that God is good, when we make that declaration, it is a statement like no other. It's a unique kind of statement because normally when you and I say that something is good in this world, we're normally just comparing it to the best of what we've seen so far. Isn't that right? So if we say that a product, maybe a car, is is good, all we're actually doing is we're comparing it to the best car we've ever owned or, or driven. And if this new one is anything like it, well, it's a, it's a good car. It's like the, the one I liked. Or if it's better than our previous favorite, then we'll say, well, this is an excellent car. It's outstanding. If we say that a restaurant or a B&B is good, again, we're just comparing it to the best that we've experienced, the best we've known so far. But when it comes to the Lord Himself, we are dealing with a benchmark of goodness that is entirely unique. You may remember that interesting incident in Mark chapter 10 when the rich young man approached Jesus with that intriguing question, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, if you remember, he picks up on that word good, and he asks the young ruler a question, Mark 10 verse 18, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. 
You see, God alone is truly good. He is uniquely good. All other goodness to be found anywhere else in the universe is but a reflection, often a very pale reflection, of the sheer goodness of God Himself. You may or may not be aware that May this year was a historic month in the world of physics. Historic because the definition of the kilogram changed. It didn't change drastically, not so much that you need to run out today and change your bathroom scales in some kind of urgent rush. It hasn't changed drastically, but it has actually changed. From 1879 until just a few weeks ago, the definition of a kilogram was set according to the mass of one particular cylinder of platinum iridium. This cylinder was given the name the International Prototype Kilogram, and it's been held, uh, I guess, in a safe somewhere by the International Bureau of Weights and Measures in France. If you had a dispute as to whether your bar of gold or whatever it was was truly a kilogram, the ultimate decider for a good long time has been this. Does it match the mass of the IPK, of the prototype, or not? That was the case for a long time. Now, that's actually no longer the case. They discovered that the IPK was actually changing in mass very, very slightly, but changing in mass over time. So they've moved to a new system, which I can't actually understand, some mathematical system. They did that just a few weeks ago. But the idea of this cylinder in a vault somewhere, which is the true kilogram, according to which all other kilograms are measured, that's quite helpful to us here, and just hold on to the idea. What Scripture tells us is that God is good. He is the essence of goodness. He is the universal standard, the prototype of goodness. There is none good, says Jesus, but God alone. None other is truly and holy and entirely good as God is. God is good in, in all that He is. That's our first point. And the next one flows right from it. God is not only good in all that He is, He is good in all that He does. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Good God. And we've been taking a look at how God is good in all that He is, as you just heard in a moment. We're going to come back and look at how God is good in all that He does. So hope you'll stay with us. By the way, if you ever miss any part of Encounter the Truth, you can come to the website and you can listen to each and every broadcast there. You can stream the program or you can download it and uh, listen to it whenever it's convenient for you. Just stop by our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, we're also a listener-supported broadcast, and that means we do depend on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book called A Good Old Age. It's an A to Z of loving and following the Lord Jesus in later years. Written by Bible teacher and pastor Derek Prime, and in this book, he guides us through 26 Christian priorities that we should hold on to in later life. He does this with biblical wisdom and practical advice, helping us navigate the unique challenges and joys that old age can bring. Again, we'd love to send you a copy of this book, A Good Old Age, as you give a gift of any amount this month. You can find out more or give online when you come to EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. All right, let's get back to the message. Once again, here is Jonathan. God is good in, in all that He is. That's our first point. And the next one flows right from it. God is not only good in all that He is, He is good in all that He does. We have an old lawnmower that we inherited with our house. The previous owner didn't need it in his new place, so he just left it for us, which is very nice. It isn't pretty or anything. It's, it's well used, we might say, but it more or less works, and I just keep using it. However, for as long as I can remember, it has been producing a pretty strange cut, what I might call an angled cut, <laughs> so that the grass is never an even length in any given row. When all is said and done, it's all a little bit uneven, all a little bit bumpy. Now, I know what you're thinking. We all know what the uh, poor workman says about his tools, right? <laughs> Uh, well, in this case, it actually was the mower. I did have a good look at it. I don't know after how many weeks and months, but I finally did sort of kneel down and have a really good look at the thing, and I discovered that the wheels were actually not evenly set, not evenly adjusted, and it really was cutting on quite an angle. A bad mower, well, it is 
going to produce a bad cut, isn't it? Just as a good mower, well tuned up, in good shape, properly set, it's going to give you a perfect cut every time. You can see the condition of the mower, actually, from the cut of the lawn. You may remember that Jesus once said that a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. That's true with people, and Jesus is talking about people there. What we do, it reflects who we are. And of course, it's true with God Himself. If the Lord is truly good, entirely good, perfectly good as we know He is, then the works that He produces, they will be good in every respect, every time. Psalm 119, verse 68 says this of the Lord, you are good, and what you do is good. God is, of course, the originator and the creator of the universe itself, and right from the beginning, He affirms the sheer goodness of what He has made. The refrain right through Genesis 1 at the end of every day of creation was simply this, and God saw that it was good, and then at the end of the sixth day, when all was said and done, God saw all that He had made, and it was very good. The creation is good. Now, we say that, and we affirm it, and it's entirely true, but we have to remember as well that we experience the goodness of the creation from this side of the fall, from the other side of the fall. God made a world in the beginning that was entirely good, and it's still good, but at the same time, it's deeply damaged by the effects of human sin. It is good but marred. It is beautiful but damaged. And of course, when we think about that reality, we have to take responsibility for it. We human beings, we bear responsibility because we have refused to live in God's world in God's way. We've refused to steward God's world as He has called us to steward it. This is a broken world, a fallen world, but it's still so good, isn't it? As a family, we went just the other day to spend an afternoon by a beautiful lake a little way down the Rideau Canal system, and sitting by this lakeside with the warmth of the summer sun and the reflection on the water and the beauty of that big blue summer sky, it was just one of those moments where you almost need to kind of pinch yourself and ask, is this really real? Did God really make such a beautiful world, such loveliness? for us to enjoy. And as we see it, and as we experience it, and as we enjoy it, we have to declare that our Creator is good. He's so very, very good. We see God's goodness in the creation itself, but God's goodness is shown not only in the things that He has made, but in the way in which He cares for His creatures. Psalm 145 and verse 8 The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that He has made. The Lord shows His kindness, His compassion, His sheer goodness in the care of His creatures, day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment. And of course, you and I, we're His creatures. And every good thing that we have and we experience in this life, it comes to us from His hand, James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. It's quite remarkable, actually, when we see the extent and the nature of God's care for His creatures in the Old Testament Scriptures. As we look at the Old Testament law, we see a fascinating window into the character of God and into His goodness. He cares for those on the margins of society, requiring in His law mercy for slaves, for fugitives, for the poor, for debtors. He even sets out laws, this is very interesting, for the care of animals. Livestock were not to work on the Sabbath. The ox would not be muzzled while threshing out the grain. A cow and a calf were not to be killed for sacrifice on the same day, and on it goes. Puritan Stephen Charnock writes, he who possesses the praises of angels leaves not off the care of the meanest creatures. And that majesty that dwells in a pure heaven and an inconceivable light stoops to provide for the ease of those creatures that lie and lodge in the dirt and dung of the earth. Isn't that nicely put? God is good to all His creatures, but He's good in a special way, isn't He, to His saved people, to His covenant people. 
to his children. God's people in the Old Testament, they knew that. They saw it. They experienced it. Psalm 25 and verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 25. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. The Old Testament people of God saw His special goodness to them, but it's only as we come to the New Testament and understand what God has done for His people in sending His Son and making Him to be an offering for our sin, it's only then that we see God's goodness in all its glory. We see His goodness to those who will be saved to those who will hope in Him. It's quite an extraordinary thing to behold. You know, you might say of a kind employer or of a thoughtful landlord or of a generous teacher, a gracious parent, you know, she's been good to me. He's been good to me. He's given me a chance. He's cut me a deal. She's been patient and kind beyond my deserving. This person has been good to me. But you know, the Lord's goodness to us in sending Jesus that we might be saved from the judgment we deserve doing so despite our rebellion, despite our rejection of Him. This is goodness of a kind that we've never seen or experienced anywhere else. God's goodness to us at the cross of Christ, it is almost unimaginable, it is incomprehensible, but this goodness that begins at the cross, it continues as we walk with Him as His people. And sometimes we have to say it comes to us in very surprising ways. The Bible makes it clear that if we belong to Jesus, God is at work in every situation we face, and He's at work for our good. He is organizing the history of the world, the circumstances of our lives, and He's doing so in order to do His people good. He's at work doing that even in the very difficult things that come our way. Perhaps one of the most familiar verses in the New Testament to believers, and it's familiar for a very good reason, is Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. In all things, in the good, the bad, the tragic, the painful, the surprising, the downright ugly, in all things, God is at work. He is at work for our good. And He is at work for our good because He is good. And He always does what is good. Whatever it may seem, however it may feel, if we belong to Jesus, the good God is at work in every situation we may face to do us everlasting good, good that will stretch beyond this life and that will prepare us even for the life to come. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Good God. We have to pause right here, but we'll continue the message next time. If you missed the broadcast, come to the website, listen online at EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported broadcast. We're able to stay on the station because of your generosity. But we want to say thank you for your gift this month by sending you a book. It's written by Derek Prime. It's called The Good Old Age. And uh, Jonathan, I've got a friend who says, you know, what you read may be not as important as who you read. So who is Derek Prime? Well, Derek Prime uh, served for many years as the pastor of Charlotte Baptist Chapel in Edinburgh, Scotland, which is quite a famous Baptist church in Edinburgh, and he had a fruitful ministry there. Derek was very well appreciated as a, as a pastor uh, in that context. Derek's gone to be with the Lord actually about a year ago now. But Derek's insight into living for Christ into old age, I think, will be profoundly helpful. Will it be a real encouragement with those who want to walk with Christ faithfully to the end? Derek did that himself, and I think it'll be an encouragement to anyone who would want to learn how to do that well, to get hold of this book and to read it. Well, we want to send you a copy of this book, A Good Old Age, as you give a financial gift of any amount this month. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. The website again is EncounterTheTruth.org and the phone number is 833-998-7884. Thanks for listening today and I hope you'll join us next time.